What's up, y'all? Shuffle. Welcome back to the final part of the Blood Moon Guide. We're going to be talking about the end game, but not just the end game, also the regions to an extent. Mostly the most threatening things about them, like the enemies and certain mechanics, whatnot. But also a couple tips here and there to increase your likelihood of success. So we're going to be getting into that. And just like part two, I did record all of this as one just giant block of video, which is why when I do these intros, it sounds a little disjointed besides the first one. That's that. Anyway, this is the last one, and here it is. To round out this series, we're going to talk about the regions in Darkest Dungeon, and then how you should approach them, especially on Blood Moon. So to start off, I'm not going to shame anyone that only concentrates on killing Ruins monsters, and then goes to the Darkest Dungeon and skips all the other stuff. It's already hard enough as it is, so if you just want to beat it and say you did it, then go ahead. If you want to be one of those people that tries to make sure you can do all of the content in the 100 weeks, more power to you. Always awesome. It is the full experience. But yeah, let's start talking about this stuff. In case it wasn't implied in what I was just saying there, to finish Blood Moon, you only have to beat the final level of the game. So that is DD4, the last mission of Darkest Dungeon, or of the Darkest Dungeon. That's all you have to beat to clear Blood Moon. You do not have to kill Countess. You do not have to kill all the bosses. You just have to beat that mission. So that means that, theoretically, if you really wanted to, you could just do missions in the ruins for 60 or 70 weeks, get everyone powered up, and then go to the Darkest Dungeon and do your best there. If you just want to beat the game and say you did it, that's fine, go ahead. And I will even add other tips to help that. So if you want to, as easy as possible, you can just focus on the ruins and then focus on the end game. And then when the town event comes up to open the Crimson Court, you can just not do it. If you never do it, it just sits there and the Crimson Court never opens. So if you don't want to deal with the Crimson Court crap, because it is challenging, then you can ignore all of that, focus on the ruins, and then finish the game. It's basically Stygian at that point, but you could do it. So if you want to do other stuff, like if you want the full experience and stuff like that, um, we'll start talking about that right now. First off, the farmstead is unnecessary. You can do it if you want, but otherwise, it's just too grindy and potentially losing heroes for a couple weeks when they start wandering around and stuff like that after dying in there is not cool. So, otherwise, I would say skip it. The only trinkets worth getting from there are the ones that cost quite a bit, except for, like, Spectral Spear Tip. But if you really wanted one of those, you could just farm the thing from the stars, which is a risk, but every time you kill it, it gives you some crystal shards. So if you really wanted to, you just kill that dude a few times. Otherwise, I would suggest skipping the farm set entirely. It's not part of the Blood Moon experience because Blood Moon came out after Crimson Court, not Color of Madness. So it's just there to help you a little bit in terms of getting some extra power if you want to grind out those trinkets. Otherwise, I would say skip it. For every other mission you're going to do, bring a couple extra torches. The reason for this isn't just the light meter depleting at a higher rate than it normally does. In Blood Moon, you should be trying to maximize your loot draws, which means manipulating your torchlight. So in case you haven't seen it, you can shift click and like uh, shift left click and spam down the torch, or you can control shift and left click and it instantly wipes out the entire torch. You can wipe out the torch at any point of the fight before the loot window shows up and still get the extra draws, which means that if you kill the final enemy, you don't have to do it before the final enemy. You can literally kill the final enemy and then snuff your torch as it's dying and then get all the extra loot potential. So you should be trying to manipulate your light as often as possible to get the maximum number of loot in your, uh, your dungeon runs, which means bringing extra torches is pretty much required. So usually buying all the torches in the shop isn't a bad way to do it, or bringing a couple characters that can boost torch like Vestal and uh, Crusader can also be helpful. Otherwise, just be pretty aggressive with it. If you see that you're about to win a fight, there's one enemy left, you're about to kill it, it's going to bleed out next turn or something like that, and you're in a room with an heirloom chest, and then outside are like two curios that you scouted, snuff that torch every single time. You want to make sure you snuff if you're going to do a couple different loot draws in succession, and if you really need to as well, you can leave loot if you have to return, or if you scout it and you see it, you can back up and stuff like that. But just make sure that whenever you snuff your torch, you're able to loot at least two things. Either a battle and a chest, or a couple curio, or a battle and a couple curio, because you want to get the maximum potential out of your torch uses. 
Longer missions are obviously more difficult, but they are also more efficient in terms of the time limit for beating the game. So if you feel that you're pretty safe and you have a, a strong team and you feel like you can easily handle a medium or long mission, then definitely do those instead of short missions. I would suggest doing short missions when everyone's level zero just to get them to level one so they get all those little bonuses and skill upgrades that you want. And then after that, only really do short missions if you're feeling uncertain. But once you start getting to like the maximum levels and power-ups of your certain bracket, right? So if you have level two heroes with level three gear, then start going for long missions and medium missions pretty consistently until they level out of that bracket. And the only exception with this being once you reach level six, because even then in uh, the long missions for level six, you stop powering up. You know, because you're already maxed out, your gear's maxed out, which means that uh, long missions and medium missions are still threatening. So you could dial it back at that point. Otherwise, if you still feel you can do it, then always do the longest mission available to you if you feel you can safely complete it. Hunger is probably something most players don't quite know the full mechanics of. Like, you know that when you walk through hallways, sometimes you need to eat food. That always just pops up. So I think everyone's experienced that in their first one or two missions. I think even the tutorial mission can have a hunger check. So always be prepared with food, obviously. But the inner workings of hunger are that they spawn as an event on a hallway tile. So if you remember curios or fights or traps, those all, all have icons, right, on the, the map. So they're very clearly defined. Hunger does the same thing. It actually has an icon, it's just not visible. You can actually see it in the wiki and I'm sure there's like a way to display it now with like a mod or something. But the hunger mechanic being tied to hallway tiles means that you can actually do some manipulation to prevent more hunger checks. The first is to keep your torch level high because you have a lower percentage chance of getting hunger checks. But the biggest one is one I always talk about in my videos, if you've ever seen me play Darkest Dungeon, once I learned how this works. I always leave Curio that I'm gonna go back for, like if I'm gonna loot something or whatever, I always leave it in the hallway if I have to make a return trip because that way it blocks the potential for a hunger check spawning on that tile. I don't know if hunger is rolled per tile or per hallway, because if it's rolled per hallway then this is actually just a moot point. But if it is rolled per tile, this does potentially block out some extra hunger checks. So I always like doing that. The same idea can also be applied to fights. If the way fights are spawned is per hallway tile, then leaving Curio also blocks those in the future. This is actually a lot easier to manipulate when the hallways are shorter, uh, specifically the Warrens, because in most of the Warrens dungeons, especially the longer ones, the hallways are always like three tiles. It's very grid-like, systematic you know, kind of mimicking a sewer, which I thought was very cool. But the tip here that you can block certain events by leaving Curio, it's very easy to do in the Warrens because it is not uncommon to have two or three Curio or something like that, or two or three events or like a trap, what have you, spawn, and using those to block these uh, other events like fights and hunger. On that same subject of hallway manipulation, one thing you can do if you absolutely steamroll a dungeon and your party is very healthy and you have like one hunger check of food left, maybe two, depending on what's happening, is you can go in and out of a room repeatedly to spawn fights in that hallway. You don't even have to walk down the hallway to the next room. You can literally just open the door and then walk back in the door and do this repeatedly and it can spawn extra fights in that hallway. When I was doing the testing for the background footage that I'm using. I was using, I think I was doing it in the Warrens, and I was only able to spawn three fights, and I kept trying, but I could never get the full hallway to spawn with fights, so I don't know if that's possible, or if I just didn't hit the percentage, right? It could just be a thing of luck and RNG, but this is very helpful for dungeons where, like I said, you did very well, you completely trashed it, you have a pretty strong party, maybe you have a bunch of level 2 heroes that are about to go to level 3, so you want to get the most out of them when they're still powered up compared to the level of content. So spawning extra fights to get extra loot can be really helpful. It can get you a lot of extra gold if you have the space. And if you get lucky and the fights are spawning right outside the door, you can actually just go in and out and then never have to worry about the hunger check for food. So just another thing to maximize your chances and then... 
Obviously, the same things we've been talking about, like torch manipulation to get yourself extra loot, still applies here. This next one I think is actually a very important tip, and that is to save boss battles that appear on your mission map for weeks when they have trinkets that you want. So the one I commonly cite for this example is saving someone like the Apprentice Necromancer for a week when it drops the Blasphemous Vial for Plague Doctor because that thing is so strong and being able to get early orange trinkets at like level 1 or level 2 will help you so much in this game. So make sure that when you're about to go do a boss, make sure they have a really good trinket for you. Don't show up when they have like a hero ring, for instance. Like you know, you don't need a hero ring at level two or whatever. You probably don't even need one for the entire playthrough, honestly, because virtue farming is already just kind of dangerous in itself. But maximizing your boss drops for trinkets is very important. And honestly, it can give you some really strong power spikes at the early stages of the game. On the subject of bosses, if you are not going to clear all of them, if you're only going to clear a handful of them, right, you just want certain trinkets, or you only kill them when they have good trinkets in the loot pool, then decide in advance which ones you want to kill. Because I think certain ones are either easier to do, or their boss trophies are actually really good. So if you had to pick a few bosses to actually kill, I would say both of the Warren's bosses drop pretty good boss trophies, especially the Flesh's Heart. I think that's the best boss trophy out there. It's just one of the best trinkets in the game. So I would suggest making sure you can kill the Flesh, and then some of the other ones are still good, like the Prophet's Eye is pretty good, and the Matchstick is solid. And I think actually the Siren's Conch Shell is okay. And the other trinkets, not so much, are uh, as good. That's a weird way to say that sentence, but you know what I mean. So if you only need to do a limited number of bosses, I would suggest the, f uh, the Flesh, and maybe the Matchstick, and Wilbur's Flag, because you have to get it to get to the Flesh Heart. And other than that, I don't think you really need any of them, even though the Prophet's Eye is probably the closest thing to uh, another good one. And still, yet on the subject of bosses, try and kill shamblers early the reason being that the apprentice shamblers are pretty weak i mean it's still on blood moon so they're still difficult but the apprentice shambler compared to the later iterations of shambler is a bit weaker like shambler scales pretty hard going into a uh, champion so being able to kill it early with a strong low level team like a level two team that has really good gear and a couple good items and like you're specifically shambler hunting if you can then it's worth doing if you can get a couple of the shambler trinkets early like the map i think the ancestors map is so good for the entire game so actually i guess it's not good in the end game because everything's scripted but outside of those right for your normal adventuring needs the ancestors map is amazing so if you can kill shambler early get it and then other than that, you're probably looking for the candle and maybe the scroll. Like, all of the Shambler trinkets are pretty good in some form or another. I think the Ancestor's Bottle and the Idol might be the weakest, but they're still okay. And I would think that if you can, make sure you get the map. Which means that when you start getting to level 1 and 2 and you have, like, solid upgrades, you should always be making teams that can fight Shamblers, even if you don't play in, like, Low Torch, because you should be expecting to run into a shambler altar at some point and then spawn it that way one of the interesting parts about darkest dungeon is how the enemies change over time so as you unlock higher levels of missions it unlocks different levels of enemies or different iterations of enemies i should say and the existing enemies always power up and that translates to some regions at the start of the game are more threatening than others and then when you get to champion other regions become more difficult than they were previously so what I'm saying is it could be like the order of difficulty is region one two three four right so we consider the base four and then when you get to champion it could be one four three two or whatever like the order could just flip entirely so what is difficult in apprentice may not be as difficult in champion so it's just good to be aware of the power spikes in the regions and I feel like I'm talking too long on this, so let's actually talk about the specific enemies that are worth looking out for and when they appear. I'm going to start off in the Warrens here. 
the most threatening enemies in the Warrens, well, the most threatening enemy is the Skyver Pig. So, Swinatar is pretty threatening, the giant worm thing is pretty threatening, and the spinning pigs are threatening, but they're part of the stress caster group that we're going to talk about. But the Skyver Pigs, those things are so dangerous. I think they're actually the most dangerous base game enemy, or they have the potential to be, because their cripple them attack is this massive cleave that can do upwards of 60 damage if it crits on someone. Like, if you combine the entire damage, right? It hits three people for however much, and then it blights them, and then if it crits, it goes up to even more. So if it hits everyone, it crits one person, that is an attack that easily does like 60 damage combined. It is very scary. The Skyver has high speed, pretty moderate dodge, a little bit of prot, and a way to get to the back line. So you really have to start considering them in Champion Warren's missions. Like, they're actually threatening enough to where when you start doing high level warrens you have to go okay can i take a skyver with this team because if you're not thinking that way one's going to show up and it is going to hurt you and it might kill someone so always be on the lookout for the the skyver pigs and have something that can deal with them the cove is an interesting area because it starts off pretty scary and then it like gets less scary because what the power spikes are in the cove are as dangerous as something like a skyver pig or an unclean giant but when you start off in the cove, the most threatening thing, which I think it's actually the hardest base game area for Apprentice, actually, and that's because of the pelagic groupers, which I call the cove lepers. They're the blue fish with the, the fishing spears and the swords. They just hit really hard, and sometimes they can roll into a group of four, and they can just be hitting everyone for pretty moderate damage, and if they crit, you know, it's a lot of damage, because all they do is direct damage. So if you're going into the cove and you don't have a way to control them, or you don't have stuns, or you don't have like ways to quickly kill two of them, or if you don't have good surprise chance, all that kind of stuff, then they're very dangerous. And they like to appear on a lot of teams. There's usually one on most of the fights in the cove, so be aware of them. They're going to be present at all levels. They start from level 0 to level 6, or I should say each level of difficulty. But otherwise, the other thing that appears that's worth noting in the cove is the uka crab it's the giant crab that takes two spaces and all it does is pinch you and slam you both of those attacks are pretty devastating which is why whenever i go to the cove i always make sure my front two characters have bleed resist this also helps deal with octocestus but also the arterial pinch can reach rank three it's just not as common so if you have like a man at arms with the flesh heart he can just guard rank three every time one's on board and that should safely get you through them, but if you do not have bleed resist going into the cove at higher levels, those crabs are going to do a lot of damage before you can cure it, unless you have like a really quick uh, plague doctor that's casting battlefield medicine. Otherwise, just be aware of that. Otherwise, the swiffy ghast or whatever, that skeleton dude on the barrel with the violin that casts stress attacks, that thing is pretty threatening, but it's no more threatening than the pelagic shaman i would think because at high levels the pelagic shaman uh is stealthing i can't remember if it does on apprentice but later on for sure it has stealth which is very threatening so i'm not too concerned about the gas it's just kind of like the same threat level as the shaman so when you're in the cove the groupers and the crabs are probably the most threatening and the uh the zombies make sure you kill the zombies but i think everyone who's been hit by that garbage knows to do that the wield may actually take my vote for the hardest champion area. I can't remember if I said the Warrens. I don't think the Warrens are the hardest. It's just the Skyver Pigs are very strong. But in the Wield, when you get to veteran missions, you have to deal with Unclean Giants, which are just outright terrifying. And then when you get to champion, you have to deal with Hateful Virgos. And there's also the Crones that start showing up. So there's just a lot of stress and a lot of raw damage that can come out of the, the Wield enemies. And also they have like pretty good mark synergy so there's just a lot of things you have to account for and blight attacks and bleed attacks my goodness there's so much stuff happening in the wheel especially at high level that it's just a very scary place to be in it's probably the area i go to the least at high level like unless i need bosses i just stop going there at a certain point because the giants with their massive damage requires that you have some way to mitigate it either by using guard with man-at-arms in the front line or weakening curse to lower its effective damage 
But then also, the Unclean Giant can blight your people, and it can also scramble your party. That's like the most threatening thing it has. So when you're there, you have to have a team that can deal with being moved easily. Because you may be thinking, oh, I can just take my Leper. He has massive hit points, you know, and then you get hit with the Confusion Spores and your Leper's in rank 4. It's happened to everyone at some point, I feel like, and it just sucks. So we have to account for it. The Crones are dangerous, but they're just another stress caster. They're not as dangerous as, like, the Virgos. Those things can uh, block your healing if you don't kill things correctly. And they do have really good HP and protection and dodge and speed for some reason. I don't know why Red Hook likes to stack all those things on really threatening enemies. So the Virgos can be dangerous as well, but you don't see them until champions. So when you're going into the wield, just make sure you are accounting for as much as you can. Like, you can't block everything. But I think being able to prepare for Blight and raw damage and some stress will probably be the best way to get through it. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to have to deal with the dogs bleeding you or the mark synergy, which you can mitigate by uh, having protect and stuff like that. And there's just a lot to unpack in the wield. So I don't want to spend more time than this on it, uh, but definitely be aware of the giants and the Virgos when you start hitting those high level missions. Honestly, the runes are a joke. They're just always going to be the easiest area. Even at high levels, their special enemy, the Bone Bearer, I think, the uh, dude with the banner, is dangerous. But, like, once you understand how he revives enemies, like, if you leave a corpse, he'll revive it. And then, also, he puts damage on his buddies and stuff like that. Once you understand how that works, usually you can mitigate it pretty effectively, so... Taking a Plague Doctor, for instance, and just stunning anyone that gets the second damage buff can do fine if you blight them and they die to the blight, they don't leave a corpse, they don't get resurrected. Or if you have some way to dump a lot of quick damage into the Bone Bearer and maybe some blight on the side, then it goes down pretty easily. But the Ruin's enemies aren't that threatening. The Bone Commanders, you know, they can do some damage. The Crossbow guys can do some damage. The Tempting Goblet dudes can obviously be threatening, but they're just a pretty default stress caster. And I actually think they're not even as threatening as the cultist girl because she can still push and pull you. Like, the uh, the bone nobles literally just cause stress every time they hit you. So they're about as threatening as anything else. Which means that the ruins is an easy area. So you shouldn't have too much difficulty here unless you're taking a bleed team. And it's like, why are you doing that? Anything that has the Bloodsucker tag or that comes from the Crimson Court DLC is very threatening. I've long been saying that I think the Crimson Court enemies are just a bit overtuned. They're very strong, and their omnipresent threat of Crimson Curse can be very detrimental. If you catch an early game and you only have like four vials of blood, it's very dangerous, so good luck. And once the Fanatic shows up, the fact that they keep cursing your team means that eventually you might run into him if you have to keep taking those infected people. Or the fact that you have to take someone with the infection because the Crimson Curse is not good. Like, yeah, you can bloodlust and get some bonuses, but for the most part, it's a huge detriment. So all of the Crimson Court enemies are just very dangerous. Even the low-level ones like the Supplicants and the Sycophants are always dangerous. The Gatekeepers or whatever that drop the invitations, they can dash out and just leave mosquitoes behind and then when you actually fight in the crimson court the chevaliers are dangerous the nobles are dangerous the crocodiles very hard sometimes there's just pretty much any enemy right in crimson court is dangerous and the boss fights are rather challenging i would say the countess is the hardest base game fight in the entire game so always be careful with the crimson court enemies like there's no or, I mean, the strategy for them is to use something... I guess we'll talk about the specific regions here in a sec, but the... Because uh, there's just enemies to watch out for. And if you're in somewhere like the Ruins, for instance, and you go, okay, I'm going to take my Plague Doctor with Blight and stuns and stuff, you can run into Crimson Court enemies, which are Blight-resistant, and the Supplicants are stun immune. So it's like, what do you do at that point? You know, that's probably their biggest threat, is the fact they can show up in an area that matches up badly against the team you're currently using because you prepare for something else. And then in that situation, 
even more threatening than normal. So always take care when you're dealing with uh, the court enemies. In the Darkest Dungeon itself, the most dangerous enemy there is probably the Cultist Priest. Like, every enemy there is threatening just because it's endgame. Even the default transformed Cultist Girl is dangerous. The dogs and polyps can be dangerous. The mini-bosses are all dangerous, but... For the first couple missions, when you have to deal with Cultist Priests, those things can put out a lot of damage and a lot of stress, and they have some pretty solid hit points, so they don't go down that quickly. So make sure when you go to the Darkest Dungeon that you have solid bleed resist, and either a lot of stress prevention or some stress recovery, because those priests are going to leave their mark very quickly. And then finally, any stress-based enemy is dangerous. They exist in all zones in some form or another, so I'm talking about the Spitting Pigs, Pink fish, cultist girl, gosh, what else? The crones, like just all of those things that can give you a lot of stress quickly are dangerous just because stress is more dangerous than hit point damage. So as long as you have effective tactics for killing backline enemies, that's about the best you're going to get. So just always be on the lookout and have some kind of strategy in mind on either killing them quickly or recovering once they start going off. Our last topic, finally, woohoo, in this series of guides is going to be the endgame in the immortal words of Doctor Strange. You are, in fact, in the endgame now. We are all in the endgame. The meta is us, whatever else you want to say. But the first tip I'll give you about the endgame, which is involving the Crimson Court missions and the Darkest Dungeon itself, that is what I consider the endgame. The first tip I'm going to give you is do your homework. You're already here looking for tips, so I'm going to instruct you to go to the Darkest Dungeon Wiki, which I'll try to remember to link in this video, at least under it or something like that. But go to the Darkest Dungeon Wiki, look at the maps for the endgame missions. It will save you a lot of grief. The Crimson Court missions are very long, and even though I've played them several times, I still don't remember the layouts perfectly like for any of them, so just go look at a map, make sure you know the best route you want to take to get loot and get to the boss safely and stuff like that. But definitely plan it and plan out your parties. Look at what the monsters are, look at what's in there, look at what you need, and then plan accordingly. You should be doing this before you even start playing Blood Moon, because I've already instructed you to build your roster for the end game so look at what the end game is and go okay i think i need these classes and then get those classes if you're trying to prepare for it at like week 70 you know and go hmm i might need an extra hound master then probably made some mistakes somewhere this coincides with my next point which is planning your darkest dungeon teams specifically in advance because you have to have 16 heroes for the end game because once you beat a mission with one they don't get to go back and also, if you have to retreat, usually you're going to lose most of your team because you're only going to be retreating after people start dying. At least that's what I'm expecting. And you always have to leave someone behind. So it is not unusual for a Darkest Dungeon mission that fails to only have one or zero people coming back. And that means you need to plan your teams in advance. Have a couple extras of heroes just in case, but also know which 16 you want to finish the game with. And if you're not planning around that, then you should be. In the Crimson Court, I think you can complete pretty much all of it by using some combination of Flagellant, Highwayman, Vestal, and some fourth character. The reason being, they do pretty well in terms of consistency, the enemies are also weak to bleed, Highwayman has a lot of reach and can do a lot of damage, and some of the enemies have either big cleave attacks or multiple actions, and having Repost helps you just get out that much more damage. Also, in something like the Countess, when you're fighting her, it can be a lot of damage quickly, and having someone like the Flagellant who can spot heal in a pinch will also help you quite a bit. It's a very long fight, so Flagellant should be safe to use all five charges of his low hit point moves, which means it should help you succeed. As for a fourth character, it's really whatever you feel comfortable with. You can use Houndmasters, a second Highwayman, Man at Arms. There's just a lot of good picks that help you in Crimson Court, but I think. The shell of those three characters is the easiest way to do most of the content. Obviously, these are not in-depth boss guides, which I do plan to do at some year in 20XX, but the quick tips here, when you're fighting the Baron, uh, make sure you pop one egg at a time and hope that the Baron's not in it. So, you know, obviously when you first do it, you have a 25% chance, then a 50% chance, then a 75% chance. Wait, no. 
no, it's a 25, 33, then 50. There you go. Yeah, of getting the Baron to appear. Also, the statuses that apply to eggs also apply to the unit inside. So you can get some easy damage rolling by doing that. But otherwise, the Baron is a fight about pacing. I mean, he even declares it with the, the axe or whatever. So having a team that can safely pop an egg, kill the enemy, pop an egg, kill the enemy, is the easiest way to tackle that fight. The way most people get into trouble is they try and bring a cleave attack and then just cleave all the eggs open at the same time. Then you have to fight for things, even though you get to heal. But yeah, being able to pace yourself and kill things and then stun them is the key to winning that fight. For the second boss of Crimson Court, the Viscount, I would suggest killing the bodies. If you put Bleed and Blight on the bodies and the Viscount eats from them, he will get those damage over time effects, which is pretty cool. Otherwise, I think the extra hit point boost that he gets from Blood Moon means that bursting him down is a little riskier because he has more chances to heal and he has more chances to do damage because he's living longer. So making sure that you get rid of the bodies, which is pretty much the core mechanic of the fight, should get you through safely. And as I was saying before, use the same combination of Flagellant, Highwayman, Vestal. You could use two Highwaymen, you could use Man-at-Arms, all that stuff, but that should do pretty well in that fight. So just controlled burn, make sure you... uh keep your hit points up, and then once he runs out of bodies, you should be able to close out the fight. For the Countess, I can give you the sarcastic advice of good luck, and then just drop it, because she is a very hard fight, but I will try and give you some tips here. The reason the Countess is difficult is because on Blood Moon, she has almost 500 HP, and she can heal, which means you have to do probably upwards of 600 damage to win, probably closer to 700, and uh, it's very, very difficult. So. Since the fight is so long, it has multiple phases, that means that the Countess just needs a couple good back-to-back -back RNG things to happen, and you can be in trouble. So if you want to see the actual fight play out, I will link a video here as well. It is my fight and walkthrough of the uh, Blood Moon Countess encounter, because I recorded it, this was like a year ago, and I talk about the team I used and the choices I made, and uh, even in that fight, I think by like turn two or three or something like that, I had some big trouble happening because she got some like really good opening turns. So Countess is very dangerous. I suggest bringing heavy bleed damage and extra spot healing. So again, the Flagellant does very well there. Since she has four actions or three actions, depending on what phase, I don't count the middle phase because she doesn't attack usually. So having a Highwayman with her post can do very well. He gets a lot of chances. You know, if Highwayman gets attacked twice in a turn, he just does a ton of extra damage with Repose, which is awesome. And you just have to prepare for a long fight. Just a long fight, long mental endurance test. There's no time limit on your turn, so definitely think through them. And yeah, good luck. For the Darkest Dungeon missions, I suggest bringing a Vestal to each one because Vestal does very well. Her consistent healing output will be very welcome. Then she has a couple okay camp skills if you need to use them. Otherwise, the rest of your teams will look different depending on the mission. So for the first one, in Darkest Dungeon 1, where you have to fight this uh, Shuffling Horror, this Super Shambler, basically. I think one Highwayman, maybe two, is really good. Just because there are a lot of cleave attacks and reposting can do a bunch of extra damage. So Highwayman does very well there. Otherwise, have some kind of plan to get your party back in order for when it gets scrambled. I mean, you already have Highwayman, so that's one dancer. But having someone else that can potentially fix their positioning is very beneficial. You can have the Flagellant who can run up three spaces if you really need to, but otherwise a couple Highwaymen, or in my case I took a Grave Robber, all those things can really help you get through the fight. Also beware of the Cultist Priest because they are present and they are doing all of their damage and stress things. For the second mission in Darkest Dungeon, I would suggest a combination of Man-at-Arms, Vestal, and Jester with your choice of fourth. It's kind of whatever you feel comfortable with. But I think, again, Highwayman can do just fine, but you might want to save your Highwaymen for later missions. The reason being, the second mission of Darkest Dungeon is considered the hardest. It's between that and the third one. I think the third one's harder if you don't know it, but then once you know it, the second one's harder. But with the second mission, it's just very long. A lot of uh, chances for damage, cultist priests, challenging mini-bosses. So it's more of an endurance test. So when you have the Jester and Vestal together, you have like the maximum recovery possible, and then you have Man-at-Arms, who has incredible camp skills, and you get to camp a bunch of times in there. 
which means you're kind of going for a, uh, a defensive type of play. So you want really good recovery and good defenses and a lot of control and then a guard to block revelation. And then your fourth person has to be able to do a lot of damage or just kind of uh, synergize with all that. I remember taking a Houndmaster when I did on Blood Moon and Houndmaster actually did pretty well. But I think you can get away with a lot of classes to uh, fill out that team. The third mission of the Darkest Dungeon, the one that's probably the biggest pain in the butt because you can always get teleported and you get a bunch of camping but you could easily run out of camping and have to do every single fight in there. But uh, the main mechanic to be worried about is the white stock in the back that likes to teleport you after a couple turns. The way this works is the chance of it teleporting you goes up per turn. So I think it starts at zero and then it goes up a set amount and then it goes up another set amount. Which means by turn three or four it's going to be looking to teleport you. Unless it dies because when it dies it resets the teleport counter. So the way I like to handle... The third Darkest Dungeon mission is actually with a Plague Doctor. The Mammoth Cyst is kind of hard to stun, so I suggest double stun trinkets, so like a Blasphemous Vial and Dazzling Charm or something like that. Or a Witch's Vial if you have it. And then just doing this same alternating strategy of Blinding Gas and Plague Grenade. Do not be afraid to use Disorienting Blast if you need to just stun one target and save your Blinding Gases, which is totally cool. Otherwise, I ran that setup with a Hellion. And the goal was to have blights rolling and stuns rolling on the stock and the cyst. And then once the stock got low enough or if I needed to do some extra damage to it, I would use Iron Swan. And then I'd go back to just hitting the, uh, the cyst up front. So this way, if you have a very controlled game plan, you can consistently kill the uh, stock every three turns. And it'll be stunned on turn three. So its chance of teleporting you is pretty much non-existent. And if you're wiping them out every three turns, you're slowly killing the cyst and then also resetting the teleport counter. So I think a control strat is probably the best in there instead of like a burst strat because, I mean, you could, if you really want to, run some heavy backline killing things like a mark team, but then the, the cyst is going to do so much damage to you very quickly that having the control elements is going to keep you alive much longer. And also, if you need to rotate other skills besides blinding gas and plague grenade the plague doctor has battlefield medicine which will get rid of that nasty blight that the cis likes to use so there's just a lot of good points in having a plague doctor for that mission even though at first glance it may not seem like plague doctor could be that good as i said previously make sure you check a map so you can pick a route to the end of the third mission because otherwise it is very tough to remember the exact path to take because when you're Doing it, even if you know where the Locust Beacon is to end the mission, and you go, okay, it's like in this direction, you could still be like one or two rows or columns off, and that could just not be cool. You take more fights than you have to. And uh, yeah, the map, like the real life Ancestors map for that mission, aka the wiki map, is probably what you should be looking at when you're doing it. The final mission of the game, Darkest Dungeon 4. I have never had an actual issue with this fight and I haven't seen people have an issue with this fight like I don't think I've heard of people wiping to it because by the time you get to it I think you understand the game well enough to where you know how to get through it it's mostly a cinematic fight and like a story driven fight which I think is completely cool I actually love what Red Hook did with the last fight because instead of having some overly oppressive and crushing final boss they had a they had a final boss that is unique and still dangerous but it's not uh, unbeatable you know you should be able to beat it on your first try and the same goes for Blood Moon so in the Blood Moon difference of the fight the ancestor has one extra hit point in the phase when he's spawning dudes so that actually makes the fight much longer it felt like when I did it and otherwise most solidly made teams will get you through it I could suggest various things, but I mean, the first time I did it, I think I used some, uh, was I used Reynold and Dismiss because I needed that achievement, and then I used, I think, an Occultist and an Arbalest, and that team just felt kind of jank, but it still beat it. And then on the Blood Moon file that I have posted online, I beat it with Team Red Hook, so default stuff. Like, you can beat it with pretty much anything, as long as you uh, build correctly and understand how it works, which I'm assuming you do. 
All right, so those are all my tips for Blood Moon. Good luck. I hope they get you started. I wish you the utmost luck if you're able to complete it, you know, months down the line or whatever it is. Please come tell me of your success. I would love to hear it. I will golf clap in my bedroom as I read the comments in your honor or pop into Discord, tell us about it because we do have a section if you need like up to the minute type of help. We have uh, the Darkest Dungeon spoiler section so you can go in there, talk about the end game safely and there's a lot of knowledgeable people in there besides myself that can help you out. With that said, thank you so much for watching. I've been meaning to do this for a long time now and I've, I've greatly enjoyed it and there's just so much to talk about and I try to even keep it to like the most helpful and condensed list of tips and it still ended up taking a long time. So I appreciate anyone that stuck through it. I'm gonna try something different and split this into several videos and uh, yeah. Other than that, if you need more ideas and help and stuff like that, drop comments, join Discord, check out my other guide stuff if you haven't already. And I'm gonna be making more character guides and more like other specialized guides like how to most effectively get through the wield or something like that. So all that stuff is coming slowly because you know school eats up a lot of time right now and i think that's it you're all beautiful thanks for watching join discord and i'll see you later